Hi everyone, welcome to another Nova event. For those of you joining us for the first time, um, we are the Neural Engineering Research Venture and our aim is to bring neuroscience and sometimes just machine learning to life in Africa and around the world. My name is Julianne and I will be your host for the event and then you can look out for Siobhan and Darby in the comments. Maybe just before we get started, can I get an indication in the comments if everyone can hear me clearly? Just a thumbs up or so. Okay, I will take that as a sign that you can hear me. So I am very excited today to be sharing NERV's global engagement. Um, so our global network of attendees now spans 83 countries worldwide, 26 of which are African countries. So we are very excited to share this. Then in the spotlight, NeuroMatch 4.0 will be the fourth NeuroMatch Computational Neuroscience Conference. The scope will include machine learning with an explicit biological link. The conference will be taking place from the 1st to the 2nd of December and will follow a hybrid approach with both, both virtual and in-person events. Be sure to check out all the opportunities via the link provided. Then, the 39th IEEE Conference on Robotics and Automation will take place at the Pennsylvania Convention Center in Philadelphia in the USA on May 23rd through 27th, 2022. As the flagship conference of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society, ICRA will bring together the world's top researchers and companies to share ideas and advances in the field. There will be an emphasis on broadening participation for African and African-American researchers and industries in robotics and automation. The ICRA 2022 conference will provide an ideal forum for sharing exciting scientific advances that will shape the future of work while also embracing economic and social considerations. The conference will be hybrid, so there will be great opportunity for global engagement. Then, in honor of our speaker today, I'm excited to be making this announcement. Data Profit is a Cape Town-based AI-as-a-service company of machine learning specialists with a global presence. The company works with manufacturers worldwide to optimize their production KPIs by existing plant data and machinery. And Data Profit is currently hiring across all departments. So if you are interested in working at the cutting edge of applied AI, be sure to check out the link provided. Then a couple of house rules. Please do use respectful and inclusive language on our platform. And remember to make use of the ask a question feature throughout the presentation. We will be taking questions live, so we will ask them as they pop up. So you can also vote for your favorite questions there. And if there are questions remaining at the end, we will invite you on screen to ask your questions live. And the most popular questions are most likely to be asked first. If you don't have a mic, don't worry about it. Or if you don't want to come on screen, I will ask the questions on your behalf. Just remember to add, please ask. Then if your connection is slow, try to refresh your browser. Alternatively, you can select compatibility mode from the audio visual help button at the bottom of the screen. And if your connection fails completely, the talk will be available to stream after the event. And I'm very excited to be introducing our speaker for today. Inspired by the significant value prescriptive AI delivered to local manufacturers as an industry consultant, Franz Kroninger co-founded Data Profit in 2014. His mission is to establish this innovative results-driven company as the leading global provider of AI as a service for manufacturing. France was among Fast Company SA's top 20 industry leaders under 30. He's also a regular keynote speaker on, international, on the international circuit at key manufacturing vertical summits, conferences, and other events. In 2019, the World Economic Forum invited France to speak at its annual meeting of the new champions, the Summer Davos, in Dalian, China, recognizing Data Profit as a technology pioneer. Welcome, France. Cool, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining uh, today. And thanks very much for that introduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit obviously around data profit and some of the work we do in the application of AI towards autonomous manufacturing. Um, before I dive too deep into that, I'll give you a bit of context as to, to where obviously I've come from um, over and above a bit of what Julianne's mentioned now. Uh, but I, I'm going to ask, please do ask questions in the course of it. I, I much prefer quite an interactive session. Um, if you have questions, as Julian's mentioned, you've got the, the chat box, we'll be watching that. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free just to, to butt in at any point. Yes. And I, I think uh, kind of beyond just the introduction of myself, as I talk about ourselves, data profit, um, I'm going to focus a lot more on kind of how we see the application of uh, specifically AI and, and more specifically deep learning fitting into 
manufacturing realm and kind of some of the principles that underpin our thinking when we apply it. Right. So um, to provide kind of a quick introduction as to myself um, before I get into the company. Uh, so I've come from a background of material science um, for those kind of abroad. It's a field that mixtures, uh, mixes statistics and business. I did a bit of work uh, with Bain & Company, and then I did my postgraduate, specifically my master's in computer vision. Uh, this was back 2012, 2013. Um, and this, this was the application of deep learning into human action recognition in video. Uh, it's quite an interesting period back then. Um, obviously, this predates a lot of the TensorFlow work and a lot of kind of the modern deep learning theories. Back then, it was all Theano, um, as far as deep learning libraries went, and kind of a lot of uh, kind of a lot of new things going on on the ground um, as people were experimenting with uh, deep learning. So that's my background. Then around about 2014, started Data Profit. We've had quite a long path um, to get to where we're going uh, or where we are right now. Uh, we've learned a lot in the application of AI, um, certainly kind of been quite early into taking a lot of the modern theory into industry um, and had our kind of mixed experiences in that space. What we found today is we found that actually AI in manufacturing works very well, right? Um, and then kind of a, a lot of our thinking and our experience kind of bubbles through to the work that we do, right? And we're going to expand upon that. So, so uh, just to give you a bit of context here, um, this is always quite an interesting graph. And I think it's, it's always an interesting one just to start on, especially when it comes from a deep learning perspective. Um, of course, I think all of us are familiar with this sudden focus on AI. Uh, that's been driven out of the results achieved in deep learning. Uh, there are multiple different areas of application of it. This graph here is showing a result upon a uh, image classification um, benchmark called the ImageNet. Uh, this is for image classification. Uh, it was originally built around 2005 and kind of 2010, it started occurring quite regularly. Uh, 2011, that first result, um, kind of you'll see, especially in varying feature transforms and various different other elements going on there, but that name of kind of those components of that algorithm, that talks to a lot of the traditional approach when it comes to analyzing um, images, right? And that traditional approach was underpinned by some strong computer vision theory, whereby uh, when you look at things, when you look at images, you often try and uh, build different uh, kind of edge detectors, you're trying to build from edge detectors into increasingly kind of abstract ideas like corners and then eventually into more and more abstract ideas like chairs, right? Uh, so very kind of traditional approach. And then uh, the work in 2012 came along, and this is what caught my attention when I was starting my master's, uh, it is Jeffrey Hinton and his lab uh, out of Toronto come and apply convolutional neural networks. Now convolutional neural networks are a specific architecture within deep learning. Um, it's a interesting kind of uh, refinement of a lot of the, uh, or some kind of the width of deep learning in order to better replicate some of the optical cortex, right? And specifically kind of the lower levels in it, there's some interesting local feature discovery, which when you start pulling apart, begin to look similar to the lower levels in some of the optical cortexes that people have observed. Uh, but of course, none of that was explicitly coded into the actual uh, neural network itself. It's all learning that and kind of building its own uh, different layers and different uh, transforms upon the data in successive layers in order to better uh, or better satisfy this classification task it was pointed at. One of the interesting themes, and I'm going to repeat upon this a couple of times, is that uh, Alex Kravitsky, and I'm going to butcher that surname, um, under the under the kind of guidance of Jeffrey Hinton out of that lab, and that's where AlexNet gets its name. Um, they weren't uh, very familiar with uh, image classification, right? They kind of quite clearly say that uh, they've taken this algorithm, adapted it, but they aren't experts in that specific field. And despite that, they were able to increase the accuracy quite substantially. It's quite a big uh, kind of point jump there uh, from the previous algorithm. And then everything successive to that 2012 date is just further refinements upon uh, deep learning networks. There have been kind of movements from full image classification to object recognition in the image itself. And you can see we're getting to increasingly better and better results. Right? 
Now, this, this kind of dramatic uh, increase year on year upon uh, longstanding or, or existing benchmarks of different kind of AI hard um, problems is something that's been uh, achieved by a mixture of different AI uh, teams in different fields. Right? So this is really kind of what's driving a lot of the hype, a lot of the excitement is just actually these benchmarks, the accuracy measures are moving quite quickly um, as we throw greater, greater compute and uh, various different architecture, architects, architectures at the, at the problem. Okay, so to give a bit of context as to data profit, um, so as mentioned, started back in 2014, we had a team of 40, uh, very much focused in the algorithmic development, um, and then obviously all the system engineering necessary to deploy uh, AI algorithms specifically in manufacturing. And we think about manufacturing as really uh, production, so we think about things underneath the roof, not necessarily supply chain, uh, but things underneath the roof. There. And we loosely group the set of systems we built, uh, we have built as expert execution systems. We've been recognized across a couple of different forums. Uh, as Julian mentioned, we participate in the World Economic Forum. Um, there is a tech, pi a tech pioneer, but um, more recently we're actually graduating into Global Innovator. Uh, we, we talk at length in the advanced manufacturing stream there, and specifically around how AI can have an impact upon manufacturing, um, how, it's, uh, how data sharing can provide value across the entire uh, kind of sphere of the space. Um, and then there are also components which are ancillary to this, which are also obviously uh, front and center when the World Economic Forum kind of comes to town, such as the just transformation and how AI uh, factors into that. The work that we do is global. So there's red dots across the map. Those are sites that we, we have this uh, system working at or are busy deploying it into those spaces. Uh, the blue dots represent some of our office spaces around the world. Um, and so we're gradually kind of building this predominantly out of Cape Town, but uh, taking it worldwide. The top right corner is kind of our North Star, and I'm going to dive a little bit deep into those results. Of course, when we're engaging with customers from an industrial perspective, for them, while it's interesting to understand that AI underpins it, really there must be some economic value. Right? And we've taken this technology, we've applied it to a mixture of different process verticals uh, across a mixture of different environments, and being able to improve the environment quite dramatically, despite us not being experts in the underlying physical process that goes into the production of the, those units. Be it uh, vehicles, be it uh, manganese, be it gold, be it aluminium, um, and kind of more recently, be it in the semiconductor environment. Right? So, to kind of um, step back a little bit, one of the interesting observations out of our history, right, um, is where are kind of the, the best uh, different industry sectors to apply AI? Right? And this has been an interesting reflection uh, for myself because oftentimes you'll hear about AI being applied obviously in social media. Um, there's obviously autonomous driving, which is kind of a, a headline grabber. Um, there are other elements within kind of uh, facial recognition um, obviously, FinTech is always very curious about AI, specifically when it comes to understanding the behavior, uh, underpinning kind of the financial transactions that, that they observe. But of course, uh, this depends upon some data feed. And when you look at it by sector by sector, uh, manufacturing as a space produces by far the most amount of data. Right? So here's an estimate, uh, which is saying, uh, it's in the order of about 1,800 petabytes produced on an annual basis in, in the manufacturing sector, right? And that spans the whole uh, space of it, but it really kind of talks to the fact that uh, in the various different aspects of manufacturing, a vast amount of data is being produced, much more than some of these other sectors, which you'd automatically assume to be the more data-rich space. Right? There are, there are a couple of other elements why we also think manufacturing is particularly good oh, sorry, for AI. So a couple of other reasons we think manufacturing is particularly good for AI. Um, one of which is the underlying process is an obviously uh, is obviously a physical process, right? There's there's no doubt about it. Um, you know, you're producing something in the physical world. There is definitely a large causal process that underpins the production of uh, these physical units. And that isn't necessarily true in some of the other spaces. Like obviously FinTech attracts a lot of attention. 
But if you're predicting prices on the stock market, it's very difficult to determine whether you actually have a right or lucky. Right? Whereas that's not the case in manufacturing. The other space is we do have a great feedback loop. Right? So um, again, kind of in some of the other environments, your feedback loop is uncertain. So to actually explore the space or, or let something like a reinforcement learning algorithm explore the space is very difficult. Right? Um, but here within the manufacturing space, uh, especially kind of production, everything under the, underneath the roof there, um, you can you can begin to kind of repeat the same activity again and again. You can explore the environment. There is definitely a feedback loop that you can take advantage of. And I'll, I'll dive a bit deeper into that. Yep. So all of that, uh, in my mind, kind of sets up the space for very good AI. Right? Um, to, to talk a little bit about one of the flagship problems we solve for, it's not the only problem, but it's one of the flagship problems we solve for, um, is we look at you know, these manufacturing sites and within each manufacturing site, there is typically a control plan. Now, a kind of an analogy to a control plan is something of a, it's, it's something of a recipe, right? Uh, principally, these manufacturing sites, when they produce a widget, uh, they're following a set of instructions, and th those instructions typically are passed down to some set of equipment. Uh, those equi those pieces of equipment are looking at the parameters, and this might be the temperature, not dissimilar to the temperature that you might bake a cake at, but in these contexts, oftentimes it's melting iron, uh, it's kind of uh, depositing amends upon um, some uh, silicon wafer substrate. Um, so there are various different elements there. And principally, if they follow those instructions well, they expect to finish with a good quality uh, widget at the end of the line, something that they can then ship to a customer and works. Right? Of course, if, if they don't follow that too closely, if it's not running on control, uh, then they anticipate that the unit, the widget that they're producing in their factory is going to fail some quality and ultimately they've lost that energy and that material that's gone into it. Right? So if they haven't followed those instructions well, but the, but the problem we look at um, is to say, well, those instructions typically are built by a set of human experts. These are application engineers, process engineers. Uh, they obviously understand and have a very good knowledge base of the underlying physical process. And they specify, you know, what is the temperature that uh, obviously this iron needs to be melted at, but then held at, and, uh, you know, what temperature does it need to be poured into a mold. Right? Um, and when things, defects begin to occur on the line, they'll go and evaluate all of the data and try and determine whether maybe it's a different temperature, right? Or maybe the chemical composition of the material input needs to be adjusted in order to accommodate some physical process they're observing on the line. Now, as manufacturing gets more and more complex, as the amount of sensors going into the equipment increases, uh, the, the complexity of that analysis increases dramatically. And oftentimes, you know, the degree that traditional kind of um, regression analysis, uh, you know, the degree towards what it can support when evaluating that data begins to weaken dramatically. Right? Simply the number of interactions between these process variables and such as that, um, they begin to weaken. Right? And so what we say is that um, when, when we kind of look out into the world, specifically into the manufacturing space, is that every factory is running according to this control plan. When you, when you begin to make defects, when you, you're losing yield, um, you need to adjust that control plan. Well, oftentimes, that control plan needs to be updated. Uh, the amount of data being produced in space, the complexity of the interactions, this is beginning to become intractable for a set of human experts to approach with traditional tools. And this is where we come in. Right? And to, to kind of characterize this from a different angle right, um, is within uh, industry, we've been through a couple of different revolutions, and you'll hear about industrial, uh, the Industrial Revolution 4.0, because that's obviously a lot of the focus, but obviously we've been through 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. And in 3.0, what we kind of as a society kind of put together was principally this manual automation of the manufacturing uh, environment. So this is, uh, you know, your traditional manufacturing environment where now you, you might imagine or you might have seen the robotic arms that go down into the places, there's uh, kind of a lot of control and just the uh, physical process automation that's gone down. Right, so fewer and fewer, well, more and more factories require fewer and fewer people to um, produce an item. And if you look at your 
PlayStation 5, you know, the, the number of people running the factory, which produces every one of those in the world, is about five. I think it's between five and eight. Right? And it's, it's increasingly part of the factory design to say, actually, principally, we can automate the entire physical process. Right? Of course, in the automation of the physical process, you've got a lot of digital uh, work going down. Um, this is all of those control uh, computers, uh, oftentimes referred to as PLCs in this space. Uh, a lot of the specification of that recipe is then passed into those computers, um, and they're doing their level best to follow the, the instruction that they're getting. But it is occurring in, a, in the physical world, so there is variation occurring in that space. These machines are wearing the input material changes, uh, the ambient temperature is changing, right? Um, and so we go from this manual process to this assistance where increasingly a lot of uh, factories, and we've seen the entire kind of gambit are beginning to try and bring all this data together and present it to some uh, set of central experts. Right? And this allows them to apply various different sophisticated analyses to it, but uh, is still dependent upon those experts driving the hypothesis. We, we are working and we're a bit more focused in the guidance space. Um, and this is where we're turning that around to say, well, this is the data. We're going to pass the data to the algorithm and I'll, I'll get into the nature of the algorithms would work. But we're going to pass the data to the algorithm. We're going to allow it to drive the hypothesis um, and then produce kind of the, the set of results out of it. Right? So this is not us uh, trying to be experts in the underlying physical process. This is us turning uh, that over to, to the um, algorithm. Right? Or the deep learning solution. And then kind of the final step and the trajectory that we look to be on is increasingly then taking that instruction out of that algorithm and pushing it back into the control layer. And it's at this point we will, we will begin to realize factories that can accommodate you know, temperature shifts, uh, gradual wear in the equipment, uh, gradual changes in the material input, and uh, make these small adjustments to avoid that failed quality. Cool. So, um, this is that's the the theory at least, right? So the reality are kind of these quite large environments, uh, not necessarily uh, clean. Lot going on in this this space, right? So this is the inside of, of uh, foundry that we've been through. Um, you know, so we, we're working in spaces such as this to introduce AI, which is oftentimes you know some of the spaces that you think least likely to have AI. The, the sites that we've interacted with. Uh, sometimes kind of uh, older than 50, sometimes 100 years old. Right? Obviously, the equipment's been replaced through time, but we've been melting iron a very long time as a, a group of people. Right? We do we span we span from this all the way through to something like this. So this is one of our customers' characterizations of how well their uh, widget needs to perform, and specifically. Uh, this widget, this is the read-write head on a disk drive. So your computer, a hard disk drive, your kind of um, high-density storage uh, units, right? So still, still dependent upon a magnetic disk. So when they think about their, their read-write head, right, it's traveling 10 atoms uh, above that uh, magnetic disk. Uh, it's doing that 15,000 revolutions per minute. Um, and they've got to uh, do that at a certain performance. It's got to read and write at a certain um, uh, interval, right? And it's got to do that at a certain accuracy. And, and they relate that uh, unit, that widget, uh, if they relate that to a 747 and that disk being the size of the Earth, that disk is flying at 800 times the speed of sound, one millimeter above the ground. And it's got to count every blade of grass. And it, it does make errors, but it can only make errors at a rate of 10 blades of grass per an area the size of the island. So, very different manufacturing regimes, and we've taken our technology and applied it into different, uh, both of these spaces, right? Which also begins to talk about the fact that, of course, you know, we as a team, we can't be experts across all of these spaces. We have to turn that over to a lot of the algorithm and a lot of our uh, kind of system that we're building. Yeah. So let me get into that. Um, the the nature of what we our building obviously has to adapt into those different spaces. And so we've got to abstract it at some level. Right? And uh, principally, we're bringing in a lot of data that represents these production processes, the chemical composition, the material inputs, the machine's performance. Uh, we bring a lot of that in, and we enable um, our models. And principally, we're actually working in an unsupervised pattern 
to discover how those uh, parameters are interacting with each other. So this is an unsupervised algorithm being applied into the space. And uh, as mentioned, kind of the basis for a lot of this algorithm is in the deep learning space. Right? Um, we talk about latent spaces, uh, but it's not incorrect to think about these as manifolds either. Right? And it, the exciting thing for us is that um, done well, this algorithm can be uh, applied into these different spaces, build a uh, knowledge of that space, and then that knowledge, that model, or that latent space that it has can be interrogated to determine various different aspects that we, we're trying to learn from. Right? So uh, I think many of you might be familiar with the MNIST database. Um, what we're showing the bottom right hand side, that's just embedding into two dimensions of an MNIST database. Um, it's a 784 long vector that represents a handwritten digit um, that's being passed through this uh, type of algorithm. Uh, of course, the algorithm itself doesn't know the specific class, right? So you can see in that, uh, that animation bottom right hand side, the classes have been colored for our interpretation, but the animation itself doesn't know, or the, the algorithm itself doesn't know the specific class. And of course, what good looks like, um, or at least our, our assumption of good here, would be that it begins to group the different classes together without us ever having told it uh, what class is which. So it's not looking for that, it's just trying to group similar together. Right? And uh, what's also interesting in that diagram is that in its final state, um, there are interesting transitions in that latent space which kind of characterize how to move how to move from one type of handwritten digit to a different type of handwritten digit. Right. The reality here is we take kind of a lot of that. Um, in this animation, it's actually principally quite a similar uh, thing that you're seeing. Um, so that left-hand side is we've taken all the process data and sometimes it's hundreds of process variables, sometimes it's thousands. Uh, these process variables can be kind of read at maybe a 10 millisecond interval, uh, maybe it's a week interval. Um, we take that and we, we kind of embed it into this um, lower dimensional space. Again, uh, working this unsupervised pattern, um, letting it discover how these different elements interact with each other. Again, we're trying to discover what is the underpinning physical process um, it might not be immediately available in all the data uh, that we have, right? Uh, but typically, we, we do see that a lot of the data characterizes at least the large movements in it. Right? So that left-hand side here is, what you're seeing in that animation is each point there is a unit of production. Um, it's being passed through this. Uh, kind of our solution here to produce or to map it into this lower dimensional space uh, the blue regions there are the kind of more common operating modes. So those are higher density spaces that we're observing. Of course, the nature of that latent space is that it might exist in many more dimensions that we can, than we can show in this animation. But for the purposes of this, we just cast it down into two dimensions. Um, and you can begin to see how our manufacturing site moves between different operating regions. We, we're working towards then interrogating that space um, and determining how to move between those different regions with a set of variables that can be controlled, recognizing that some can't. Right? Um, and this is again then taking that the model of the universe as the algorithm sees it, uh, interrogating it, um, and then kind of providing instruction back into the control environment. So it's making the small changes to that recipe in order to then kind of affect some change at the manufacturing site and witness how that manufacturing site then begins to move in this. Um, latent space. Right? Now, we then have some uh, knowledge that we overlay on top of that. We know where re good regions are, we know where bad regions are, and of course we're trying to determine what is the mapping from one region to the next region um, in the smallest number of steps. And that, for our customers, realize a lower rate of defects. Right? Um, of course, you know, typically they're looking to maintain or satisfy multiple objectives. Um, it might be throughput, maintaining throughput while reducing the number of defects that they're producing. Right. This, that bottom chart there, uh, in terms of that defect rate, that is something we've realized at a customer site. Uh, the first year, they hadn't applied um, some of the prescriptions we're providing. Uh, and then in the second year, um, we see the reduction of variance in their quality, and then ultimately a elimination of some of their defects. 
which historically was something that they've always been working towards, um, but usually they've approached it in a pattern of a much more traditional uh, thought pattern, which is to try and apply tighter and tighter controls, right? which is to say they're trying to make sure that their machines operate more and more closely to a specific parameter and they try and control the entire environment uh, more and more tightly, including ambient temperatures, elements like that. But that narrower control means that uh, oftentimes when they, they uh, receive some bump in the system, the system is made a lot more fragile. Right? The, these are results that we've then achieved in different environments. Now, I think the, the more interesting thing for, for this space um, is in each of these different environments, we're principally running the same architecture to produce these, these spaces. Now, if we are to talk to you know, the foundrymen in the gray iron foundry and tell them, actually, we've solved the problem in a completely different space, like fish meal, he thinks that's interesting, right? So of course, it's, it's interesting, but uh, for him, he, he won't accept the idea that um, the same algorithm can solve fish meal uh, problems and that that can be applied into the foundry space. It's 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 kind of counter to his own experience to say actually no you need to have a lot of expert knowledge in the specific environment before you can provide substantial improvement. Note. The exciting for, thing for us is that well we, we don't necessarily we don't need to be experts we can actually depend, uh, throw a lot more of that on the algorithm itself. Uh, it can discover these underlying physical processes without us having to embed expert knowledge um, from that space into them, right? And this to us is how we gradually take quite narrow AIs and begin to generalize them. Now, again, this problem is still quite a, a narrow one, but when you look at the scope of different physical processes that we've applied it to, we've been surprised at the fact that we can take principally the same architecture and apply it to these different spaces because it is very much against uh, kind of the traditional thinking. Right? But it is one of the promises of what uh, deep learning uh, is, is making, right? whereby you can take um, and generalize the underlying algorithm, notably kind of, well, underlying architecture, train it for the specific space, and realize good results in that environment. Right. And this, this talks back to those original results Jeffrey Hinton and his lab were achieving, whereby they weren't the experts, they're taking an algorithm. Again, uh, so in that specific space, they're making it run more efficiently with a specific architecture, uh, but they weren't presenting themselves as experts in image recognition or image classification, rather. Right. I think this is made most real for me in the context of some of the world work that we've done. Right. Um, again, this is a physical process very well understood uh, from our customers' perspective. They've been welding a very long time. This is work done with some uh, kind of, uh, well, with a German OEM, uh, automotive OEM. Right? They, they thoroughly understand this environment. They understand the physics of it. And some of the interesting aspects or the standout points for me here is, you know, I, I, I presented this idea that the spaces are getting increasingly complex. And a lot of the environments we're interacting, interacting with are. But uh, in the world space, it wasn't specifically con uh, complex. There were only six input parameters governing kind of the specific world head. And these parameters were what we were applying our unsupervised algorithm to. We're discovering kind of the different ways that these parameters interact, right? Um, not just, you know, it's, it's work that's relatively well understood by the expert engineer as to how these parameters interact. But we were we were just putting that forward to the unsupervised algorithm to discover how they interact. Um, and then uh, using that kind of model for, of its own understanding, uh, interrogating it and presenting some prescriptions back to the space. And we managed to reduce the defects quite significantly, right? Which is us kind of, you know, one reflection at saying, um, when we look at the results achieved out of some of the research environments and the, the dramatic changes in the performance of algorithms upon different benchmarks, we have seen that we can also produce dramatic changes in the uh, performance of principally very well optimized environments. Right? 
Um, my book time to, to touch on some of the other pieces of work that we do. Uh, we also apply a computer vision into the space. Um, of course, computer visions had a very good run in, in terms of improvement of quality, and uh, more and more so, you know, there are different applications coming to the forefront. Uh, we do apply computer vision. Um, it's an it's a ML space. It's, it's there to recognize defects upon the surface of items. Right? Um, it's there to perform various different OCR upon uh, pretty messy kind of surfaces. Right? Um, it's there to determine whether the unit itself was assembled correctly or incorrectly. Right. Uh, historically, uh, kind of these sites have depended upon you know, either human inspectors or uh, just some other physical process to determine this. Uh, this has been specifically quite good for improving the accuracy of those systems and then also improving the fidelity of the data that underpins these uh, environments. Right. Um, I think also a nice aspect from, from our perspective, and it's, it's nice to see this come through. Uh, oftentimes you hear about you know, the badness of AI and the amount of compute power that it requires and what that compute power costs in terms of just energy and what that energy costs in terms of carbon. Uh, but when we reflect upon our work, we find that uh, in the reduction of defects, uh, we're able to save a lot of energy, right? Um, and of course, with that energy, you save the carbon consumption there and we are able to quite dramatically reduce um, or eliminate unnecessary carbon emissions in some of these heavy energy environments. Right? And, and this is this is kind of how, uh, especially from AI, from that perspective, can improve the emissions. You know, manufacturing itself isn't isn't a simple industry when it, it comes to the circular economy in terms of improving also in terms of improving efficiencies when carbon when you think about carbon emissions i mean any manufacturer is taking something out of the earth and turning it into some physical medium that we then go on to find some value in um, but we're on we are enabling them to be much more efficient in the use of the energy right and so that thousand or uh, two thousand to four thousand tons of carbon dioxide that's at one of our foundry sites we're busy rolling this out to tens or hundreds, right? Um, and that offsets this team's carbon footprint by uh, orders of magnitude, that single site. Right? So quite proud of that result. Um, a little plug here at the end, if you're interested in the work we do, if you're interested in anything I've said, please do reach out, right? Um, this is who we are, uh, as mentioned, Team of 40, predominantly based on the Cape Town, so we're fortunate in that regard. Um, this is who we are, please do reach out. There are a couple of links there. There's my email address as well. So, uh, questions? Cool. Thanks so much, Franz. Very interesting talk. And I must say, it's very nice to have an in-person speaker for once. Um, so, I mean, you did touch on some aspects about the generalizability mm -hmm. of, of the work done and the applied AI. But I'm wondering, what are the biggest challenges when scaling AI implementations to various production processes and plants? Yeah, and, and principally, I think, um, of course, in, in research, you've got very good data, typically. You've got data set up to support some evaluation of some algorithm, right? So it's being built in a very specific pattern. But uh, one of the difficult, thing, difficult things to traverse when applying that practically is that uh, in the real world, data hasn't been built to support some set of algorithms. Uh, nine times out of ten, most of that data gathered in that graph that I showed at the top is built for compliance or control. So this is a company saying, well, we need to keep this environment in control. So we've got the set of data and we can watch it to make sure that it's remaining in control. Or some external body is going to determine whether what we've built is good. And so we need to collect data for compliance reasons. Right. Um, and that's certainly the case in manufacturing. And I think one of the harder things, challenges that we face and we're busy working hard upon it is to say, well, if we were to take that data and we are to uh, build it into something that you can use some intelligence upon, you've got to embed context, you've got to uh, connect various different data streams together, you've got to break data out of different silos that have historically existed for control or compliance and connect it all together. Right. And if you can read the balloons at the bottom right, I don't know if the slides gone, right? Uh, but I think that connection oftentimes is one of the hardest things that we've got to achieve is how do you take the data systems that are working today and transform them into something that can support some type of intelligence, 
but yeah that makes sense i also want to take this time just to remind our audience members to post your questions if you have any now is your time to get them in um, then the next question kind of ties into what you were speaking about just now as well. But I mean, as they say, sort of 90% usually goes into data preparation. Um, so what proportion of client data is ready to be modeled when it is received and what challenges do you face in preparing the specific data? Yeah, I mean, I mean there's a broad set of challenges that we face. We, we you know, we were talking to that fish meal site they were working with handwritten data right and that's how they've historically run things in the control which sure okay maybe that makes context in, a, in an official mill environment uh but we've certainly also seen that in semiconductor fabs where actually still writing data down um and so it's all our challenges and a lot of them again going to to um kind of transforming that data into some electronic format right but it, it's beyond that what you know, the, the problem that we, I described there is actually, you know, readily available to be solved with the existing data that they are collecting, which is exciting for us, right? Um, so I'd say in the order of about 60, 70% of cases, there is some good data. There's always connection that we have to go down, uh, that has to go down. Uh, but 60 to 70 percent of customers have some good set of data and actually a lot of our work in the uh, sales and engagement process with customers trying to convince them actually that data is pretty good and the way we think about doing it is to say actually you've been running your factory in control it's not a random process you've been watching this data for some time you've obviously set about collecting a some set of data that you think is valuable and we agree with you that it is valuable and we can actually use it in a more efficient pattern but Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so it seems there have not been any questions posted yet. So last chance for anyone to to get a question in. Any final thoughts from your side? No, maybe a question back to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Julian has recently joined us. This is true. Um, and uh, obviously you've come out of a bit of background and research. What, is, what has been some of your strongest contrasts moving from academia into um, into practice? Um, I'd say sort of specific application. Um, yeah, just in terms sort of academia, to my mind at least, is this very isolated environment of, or controlled environment rather, where you have a lot of control over the things you need to um, sort of perfect in order to model your data. Whereas I think the, the main thing for me coming into industry is just to see, like you were saying now as well, sort of the messiness of, of real world data and um, the way, if you are not the one setting up the experiment, for instance, to collect the data, it's an entirely different ball game to actually then go on to model the data and to prepare the data and so on. Yeah, so I'd say that's the biggest thing for me. Okay, okay. Yeah. Peter, I see, I see we've got a, I've got a question. Um, I see we've got a question. Your, your question here is, uh, how do you see the, And to support some of manufacturing's objectives, uh, we've got to build certain AIs. And to touch a little bit on manufacturing's objectives, in a perfect world, uh, your manufacturing site builds a lot size of one. So they can make a specific widget for a specific person. That's any unit, uh, any amount of customization. Right? But in, in reality, of course, we've got these high volume sites that are not customizable so that we can achieve the economies of scale. So, so I think where AI swings in, and I'm, I'm again focused in the world that we're involved, which is these production processes, uh, where AI swings in is that kind of um, being able to support greater and greater customization while maintaining some of the economies of scale that these sites work at. Right? Uh, it is one of the harder things for a lot of the older sites to move or to swap between different products, um, but set up correctly uh, with the right data systems, the right degree of control, and then finally the right intelligence into a production site, you can facilitate greater changeovers and greater customization. So that's one of the elements. 
that's far in the future, right? More, more narrowly, some of the immediate aspects that AI is providing is uh, there are a lot of cameras going down in factory sites around the world. Uh, computer vision increasingly is helping in all aspects. This is things such as Different angle of monitors. Many of these manufacturing sites think about lights up facilities, which is if if you can make an environment run with out the requirement of people being present, you can turn off the lights, you can turn off the air conditioning, um, and you can run a factory in the dark, which is a more efficient process. Right. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. With that, I think we will then conclude this event. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Seems to be a bit of a lag. Cool. There we go. Yeah, so thank you so much, Franz, for joining me and for your for your very interesting talk. Let's all give a virtual round of applause to Franz for, for agreeing to be our speaker today. And also do remember to subscribe to Nerve's mailing list and calendar. I'll be sharing those links in the comment section and thank you to all of you for attending. I will hopefully see you again for our next event. Thank you. Cheers everybody. Thanks.